This is the uh, second half of uh, bonding and molecular structure. And we're gonna break this up into uh, three parts. Molecular shapes will be one part. It's kind of a long part. Then we'll be looking at electronegativity and bond polarity along with molecular polarity. And finally, we'll do bond properties, order length and dissociation empathy. So why do we want to know about the molecular shape of molecules? And, and the answer is really simple. It turns out that the shape of the molecule determines how it's going to function, especially in a biological setting. So uh, for instance, there's a drug called thalidomide and thalidomide was given to pregnant women to reduce uh, uh, morning sickness. It turns out that thalidomide has two different um, shapes. One shape would be called left-handed and one shape would be called right-handed. Turns out that one of those shapes actually prevented morning sickness. But the other shape actually caused birth defects in children. And what it would do is it would throw, it would um, slow down areas that were growing fast. And so what happened was uh, children would be born with um, very shortened limbs because the limbs uh, grow very fast compared to the rest of the body. If you look at uh, uh, pictures of fetuses, they're like a little lima bean to begin with and very short limbs compared to the torso. And over a small period of time, those limbs grow very fast. So if you have a slowing down of that fast growth, you end up with shortened limbs. So handedness or the, the shape of the molecule has a great effect on how, how the molecule behaves. Uh, in addition, another example is uh, oil and vinegar. Oil and vinegar do not mix. Well, why don't they mix? It turns out that uh, they have different molecular polarities. Water or the vinegar part is very polar and the oil is nonpolar. And it turns out that polar and nonpolar molecules don't mix very well, especially when they're really polar and really nonpolar like vinegar, polar, and oil, nonpolar. So you can also have different if, different uh, depths or different uh, amounts of polarity or non-polarity. You can be either non-polar, slightly non-polar, very polar, absolutely polar, you know, different grades, if you will. And depending on the grade of polarity, things might mix or not mix so well. So in fact, there's some things called emulsifiers, which kind of are polar, kind of not polar, so that they can help polar and non-polar things mix. All right, so this is why you might wanna know about molecular polarity. Now for bond properties, order length and dissociation and enthalpy, that helps us to understand why certain reactions are endothermic and why things are exothermic. And bond order is basically, is it a double bond? Is it a single bond or is it a triple bond? Length is not so much that we wanna know numbers, but we wanna know, is it longer or shorter? And dissociation enthalpy is, the amount of energy it takes to dissociate a bond. And as you would expect, if you have a single carbon-carbon bond, it takes less energy to dissociate than a carbon-carbon double bond. And that takes less energy than a carbon-carbon triple bond. And so for these dissociation enthalpies, where we tend to compare two atoms that are bonded together, they could be alike or they could be different. So carbon-carbon, they're alike. And then you could look at a carbon-nitrogen single versus a carbon-nitrogen double versus a carbon-nitrogen triple and look at the bond dissociation energies. So how much energy it takes to separate them. And in general, it takes more to dissociate a triple bond than a double than a single, especially if the atoms are identical or the same two atoms like carbon and nitrogen. So that's why we wanna know about these things. And we're gonna start with molecular shapes. So with molecular shapes, the goal is to use a valence shell electron pair repulsion theory uh, some people pronounce this as VESPER, uh, to predict the shape of simple molecules and polyatomic ions to understand the structures of more complex molecules. So valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So what we're talking about are valence shell electrons and the pair means regions of electrons. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So there are regions of valence electrons on an atom. 
the regions repel one another. And the reason they repel one another is because they have negative charge. They have electrons in them. We call these regions electron pairs. So you need to understand that electron pair in these lectures and region are interchangeable. Sometimes I may fall into the use of cloud. So I may call it a cloud or a region or electron pair. They are all the same thing. Now the most stable 3D arrangement of the regions is when they are farthest apart or furthest apart to minimize repulsion. And you also have to remember that these regions are on an atom. These are not regions that are on different atoms. They're regions on one atom. Now to get the molecular shape, we're gonna be going through these steps. First, you need the formula of the compound or it could be a polyatomic ion. Then you need to be able to get the Lewis structure. Then you identify pairs, regions, and how many you have. And then you get the electron pair geometry, that's Vesper. And then finally you get the molecular geometry once you get the electron pair geometry. So let's take a look at molecular shape. So we're looking now just at electron pair geometries. So this is pair geometry. And here the atom is represented by the letter A, regions or pairs, same thing, are represented by balloons or teardrops, or you could call them clouds. Okay, so let's look at the two pair electron pair geometry, two regions. So here's my central atom A, and here are two regions of electrons. What is the best way to separate those electrons? Well, here, if I let where these two pins touch be the central atom, this is a great deal of repulsion. And here it's getting better and better and better. And it's getting better and better and better. And that's pretty good. But here it's getting worse because these two regions are getting close together again. So what is the best way to put these together? Opposite. So here we call this linear. And the angle between the two regions is 180 degrees. Now, what if you have three pairs? So I'm gonna have one pair here and another one here and another one here like this. And what is the best for three regions? Well, it's gonna be something like this, a propeller. Now, these are horrible examples of what to use. So I've got something better to use. Well, I can show you the pairs. So this would be the example of two pairs. That's the best you can do. So what would three pairs be? That would be that. So you can see why this one is called linear and the angles are 180 degrees. And this one's called trigonal planar. So you might be asking, well, why is this one called planar? Well, because it's rather flat. And with any flat thing, when you look at it on the edge, it's a lot thinner. So here's a flat triangle, trigonal planar. And you know what? Trigonal planar sounds more scientific -y than flat triangle, so that's why we call it trigonal planar. What are the angles between these regions? 120 degrees. You want to memorize these names and these angles and these drawings. You want to be able to do them. Okay, we have three more to look at for electron pair geometries. So we're just looking at regions. So let's focus on uh, this next idea, so this is not a, a third one. This is just an idea of something called wedges and dashes. So here you can see the three that's trigonal planar. And if I turn this on edge, you can see what I have is this one region coming towards us and this one region here going away from us. So how do we represent this if we're looking at it from the side? And the answer is, well, this region here, since it goes straight up, it's just a line because it's in the plane. It's, this is parallel to the plane of the paper. But this region here is coming from the central atom towards us. That's this wedge here, this thing that looks like a piece of cheese, a wedge. Now, why is the wedge drawn this way? Well, if you take a look here at this wedge, you can see if I tilt this a little bit, where my finger is touching the wedge, it's farther away from us. And here at the end that's closest to us, it looks kind of big, okay? 
And it's modeled after this idea here. So here I have a sunset. Here's a road coming from this horizon. This part of the road that's very narrow is far away. This part of the road that is really wide is closer near to us. And in fact, this point here is called the infinity point. So here, the wider part of the wedge is close to us. The narrow part is farther away. And this is kind of a neat idea here. In fact, you know, someone thought it was such a neat idea that they decided to make a car symbol out of it. So here, you'll notice the narrow part, it's far away. The near part, it's wide. And here, this is the road going off into the horizon, which is far away. And this point here is called the infinity point. So the car maker took advantage of that idea, infinity, and made the infinity car. So by and far, I think this is the coolest car symbol of all. It beats all the other uh, to pieces as far as I'm concerned. But you know what? That's just my opinion. Okay, so the wedge here, where it's wide, it's close to us. Where it's narrow, it's far away. Now, what about the dashed lines? The dashed lines mean the opposite. So this part of the dashed line on the A, the central atom, is close to us. This part is far away. The other way to do this is to draw it this way. So here we have this part is close and this part is far away. So what do we do for this part where this is far away and this is close? Well, we could do this. So here where the central atom is, it's close and this is far away. Um, personally, I don't like that. This is confusing to me. So I don't use that, although I have seen books use that. And you could actually have a molecule that is like this and you could even do things to make it look like things are closer or farther. For instance, if you had a molecule that looks like this, uh, since here at the end of the wedge, it's closer to you, you can make a larger H because the H's will look close, uh, bigger if they're smaller. And here, if it's farther away from you, you can make a smaller H. So here the big H because it's closest to you, the small H because it's farthest away from you, and the medium sized H because it's the medium distance from you. Now, rarely do you see anyone draw things where they draw the symbol of the element a different size. So you do have to understand what the wedge means and what the dashes mean. Now, you'll notice here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. And here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. And so you might be thinking, how many do I have to draw seven dashes? And the answer is no. You draw as many dashes here as you need so that you get from one place to the other. And if it happens to be four dashes, it's four dashes. If it happens to be 15, it's 15. You just draw as many as you need, not seven, unless seven works. All right, so now you understand the wedge and the dash. And that's gonna be important for the following geometries. So now remember, we're still looking at the electron pair geometry or region geometry. So let's look at four regions. So with four regions, a lot of people think it's gonna look like that. There's four regions and that's the best you can get. These angles are 90 degrees. And you'll notice the more regions we have, the smaller the angle. We had 120 degrees for linear. We had 120, excuse me, 180 degrees for linear, 120 for trigonal planar. And now we've got 90 degrees for four regions. Well, turns out that this is not correct. Here is a better representation of four regions. Now notice these angles are 90 degrees. So if we can get those four regions to be a bigger angle apart, that's gonna be more stable. Because remember, these regions are electrons and they repel one another. Well, take a look at this. So I'm going to take this molecule, if you will, or this electron pair geometry and rotate it around. And you'll notice it has a three dimensionality to it. It almost looks like one of those jacks you uh, throw on the ground, you drop a ball and you pick up the jacks, except those tend to have more uh, points on it, if you will, than this. This only has four points. Okay, so if I take a look right here and put these at uh, parallel to the paper, you can see that that angle is bigger 
than 90 degrees. And if I take a look at any two of these angles, um, and I can do that with another molecule where I can assure you that we're looking at different, different parts, let's see. I'm picking uh, something up out of a jar here of molecules. Ah, and here we go. Okay, so you can see what I have here is the same molecule as the one with all these white spheres on it. And these two are pretty much identical in shape. I'm going to take these two and put them off because we're focusing on four pairs. One, two, three, four. You can see easily that there's four because I've got the white, I've got the uh, orange, I've got the green, and I've got the purple. So four regions. And you can see that uh, if we take a look at the angle between the green and the orange, it's greater than 90 degrees. If we look at the green and the purple, it's greater than 90 degrees. If we look at the green and the white, it's greater than 90 degrees. In fact, if you look at any two regions, the distance between them or the angle between them is greater than 90 degrees. So this is more stable than this. This is not the shape it's going to be. This is the shape. So here is what I have for this shape. And you can see that this region is coming towards us, so it's a wedge. And this region is going away from us, so it's a dashed line. So what is this called? It's called tetrahedral, and the angles are 109.5 degrees, a little bit greater than 90 degrees, but less than 120, all right? Now, the reason it's called tetrahedral is because if we look at it from the top, can you imagine that the bottom three dots, if you connect them, they form a triangle, and that's one side of this figure. And if you look at these three dots, the green, the white, and the purple, they form a triangle, and that's another side of the figure. And here, the green, the purple, and the orange form another triangle that's a third side, and then the green, the white, and the orange form a fourth side. So there's four, four sides to this figure. And it turns out that hedron is a side. So tetrahedral means four-sided. So this is four-sided. All right. So that's the electron pair geometry for four. Uh, tetrahedral 109.5. Now. For five pairs, what are you gonna have? Well, it turns out, and do you see the middle of this? It looks a lot like the flat triangle that I had before. And this is the reason why I showed you the wedges also, as well as for the tetrahedral. The five is gonna look like this right here. So this you can see has five regions. One, two, three, four, and then five. All right, so it looks like three of the regions form a flat triangle and the other two regions are opposite of one another like the linear. So it's like a combination of the linear and the flat triangle put together, okay? So it turns out that uh, these regions are not considered to be exactly the same. Uh, and the angles between them are not all the same. So these two regions that are on the opposite of one another, they're like the axis upon which the earth rotates. So the, this could be the axis of rotation for the earth. And what do you call the middle of the earth around which uh, uh, you would split the earth into two halves, the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere? You call that the equator. So these regions are called equatorial, and these two regions are called axial. So axial, AX is often the abbreviation used for that. The two regions that are opposite of one another are called axial, and the angles between the two axials is 180 degrees. And for the equatorials, the ones that go around the middle, if you take a look, the angle between two equatorials is 120, just like a flat triangle. So an equatorial, equatorial angle is 120 degrees. And if you look at the uh, equatorial 
axial angle, it's 90 degrees. So what do they call this? They call this trigonal bipyramidal because if you take a look at this figure here and I cover up this bottom axis and look at the top, it looks like a pyramid, only it's a three-sided pyramid, right? And then if I cover this part up and we look at the bottom, it's an upside down pyramid, but three-sided. So what do we call this? Bipyramidal for two pyramids and trigonal for both pyramids being triangular rather than square pyramids, which is what we're used to when we think about uh, uh, archaeology and geography and stuff like that. Or I think it's archaeology, wouldn't it? The pyramids of Giza, they tend to be square pyramids. So this is going to have an impact later when we start looking at molecular geometry. But remember, this is just electron pair geometry. Where we're looking at five regions. What's the best orientation of those five regions. And this is the last type, six pair, although you can have seven pair. So six pair or six regions, what are you going to have? You're going to have a shape that looks like this. So let me show you that one. It looks like this. So you notice these two are axial, but also these two are axial. And these two are axial. So there's no equatorial and no axial on this. They're all the same. And all of the angles are 90 degrees or 180. Generally, we just say it has all 90 degree angles. And so it looks like this. And um, here is how you draw that if you draw all of the regions. Now, how many sides would this have if you connected three sides and drew a triangle? So here's one triangle. Here's another triangle, here's another triangle, and here's a four. So we got four on top, and we got one, two, three, four on the bottom. What do you call something that has eight sides? Well, eight is octa, so octahedral, and the angles are 90 degrees. And remember, for this one, there is no axial, there is no equatorial. All positions are equivalent. All right, so I want you to recall that we said to get the molecular shape or the molecular geometry, we need to go through these steps here where you talk about the formula, you get the Lewis structure, you find out how many pairs and get the electron pair geometry. So you've just been introduced to the electron pair geometries. And now we're gonna take those electron pair geometries and we're gonna get molecular geometries. The electron pair geometry influences and defines the molecular geometry. But the molecular geometry is also defined by what the regions are or what the pairs are. So let's take a look at what constitutes a pair. Remember, this is a region of electrons. You could have a lone pair. So that would be two dots, two unbonding electrons. So here, an example of this is if you have a nitrogen with a lone pair. You could have a single electron. So that's a pair. Okay, yeah, I get it. One electron is not a pair. And so this name, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory is a little weird because it doesn't have to be a pair. That's why I like uh, valence, uh, electron, or valence shell electron region repulsion theory. This is a region of electrons or electron as it would be. You could have a single bond. So that is a pair. Now definitely that's a pair of electrons, but that counts as one region. Now you could have a double bond. That's one region. I know four electrons is not a pair, it's two pair, but it counts as one region and therefore one pair. So you have to expand your definition of pair when it comes to this. Pair means region. OK, it's kind of like the idea of a couple. I went to a store once and I said, well, I'd like a couple of scoops of chocolate. They go two or three. And I looked at them and I said, when was a couple three? I don't know. A couple is two to me. So I had to expand my idea that this person thought, well, a couple could be three. So I said, I'd like two. All right. So this is one region. And if you had a triple bond, that would be a region. 
And a lot of times I will represent these like this. So that's one region. This is one region. This is one region, one region and one region. So each of these is represented by a, what, you would, what I would call a teardrop or a cloud or a balloon, something like that. That is a single region. So each of these is a region and you need to get used to identifying regions on an atom. Okay, so let's take a look at some different examples. So right now we're gonna be looking at a linear electron pair geometry, which means two regions. So here's a Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. And for this carbon, you'll notice that it has two regions. This pair is one region. This pair is one region. A double bond is one region, one pair. Okay, so what's the best orientation for these two pairs? As far apart from one another as is possible. This is bad. That is bad, 90 degrees apart. Now you might be asking, and this is a great question, what about these pair over here? We're only looking at the pair on the atom in question. So in this case, we don't care about this oxygen. We don't care about this oxygen. We only care about this carbon. So on this carbon, how many pairs are directly on the carbon? One, two. This pair is not on the carbon, so it does not influence carbon's molecular geometry. So remember that also, when you count pairs, you're only counting the pairs on that atom. So two pairs, linear, 180 degrees. Here's another molecule that has an electron pair geometry where there's two, one pair here and one pair there, two pairs. And so here they'll be 180 degrees apart. So this is also linear, 180 degrees. Don't worry, you'll get used to calling a, a, a triple bond a pair in a little bit. Okay, so now let's look at a trigonal planar electron pair geometry. So we're looking at three pairs here, three pairs. So here's an example, BH3, where you have one, two, three bonds to boron, and each one of these bonds is a pair, so it'll be trigonal planar for the electron pair geometry. And then it'll also be uh, trigonal planar for the molecular geometry. Here's another example, CH2O, where this is the Lewis structure. And here's the electron pair geometry. And here, you know, for the electron pair geometry, let's go ahead and do this so that we can focus on the pairs. So three pairs. Now over here, let's get rid of the teardrops and just draw the bonds. So this is also gonna be called trigonal planar and 120 degrees. Now let's look at sulfur dioxide. Now sulfur dioxide has 18 electrons. And if you take a look at this, this has 18 electrons, eight around this oxygen, eight around this oxygen, and that's 16 plus two more on the sulfur. So that's 18, 18 electrons. So here, this is also gonna have an electron pair geometry of trigonal planar. So here you'll notice when I draw my balloons or my teardrops or my clouds around the pairs, that is a definite trigonal planar electron pair geometry. But when we look at the molecular geometry and we get rid of those teardrops, this pair does not extend out into space. This pair is right there kind of on that sulfur just like a, well, in this case, it's, it's on the bottom, it's like a diaper. It's right there on the sulfur, and these are the two arms. So this does not add any, any sort of dimensionality to the molecule itself, other than it's pushing these two pairs away. So what do you call this thing that looks like, well, I would call it, I'm going to redraw it here. Well, this is what the shape is called. It's based on this right here. And I know what you're thinking. That looks like a boomerang. And if the, I had come up with this theory, I'd call that the boomerang. But it's not called the boomerang. They call it bent. 
because if you put your arm straight out, it's not bent. And then if you bend it at the elbow a little bit, it's bent. And so straight, linear, bent. So they call it bent. Now, what is the angle here? The angle here is about 120 degrees because the angle here is 120 degrees. You'll find that that's not exactly the case, but it's a darn good guess. And that's the guess I would want you to make on a test that's 120 degrees and it's called bent. So these are examples where you have three electron pairs and the molecular geometries that go along with those. Okay, now let's look at a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. So we're looking at four electron pairs, four electron pairs. And these are the standard go-to molecules for showing four electron pairs. This is called methane, this is called ammonia, and this is called water. So here's the Lewis structure for methane. You'll notice that it has four pairs. So I'll draw the circles or the balloons around each pair. And you would draw this tetrahedral shape, 109.5. Now, here are the four pair for ammonia. Four pair, and this is the shape you would draw. This is the best way to draw the shape, the lone pair on top like a little hat. Let me show you what this would look like if I drew the lone pair, say, right here where the wedge is. We would then have this. So if you take a look at that, which gives you a better idea of what's going on? And let me show you what this structure looks like. It looks like this. Now I would say this looks like a kind of a flattened three-legged stool. Here's the lone pair on top, okay? Compared to this right here for methane. So here we've got the three-legged stool and we call this trigonal because it's triangular and pyramidal because it's a short little pyramid. Now, what are the angles here? Well, because they're all 109.5 here, they're gonna be 109.5 here. Okay, and lastly, what about water? Let's see. Uh, I gotta go digging for my water molecule. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So here's my water molecule. In these molecular model kits, uh, a very common feature is that the white spheres are hydrogens, the black ones are carbon, the blue ones are nitrogen, and the red ones are oxygen. Uh, here for this oxygen, uh, what I've drawn here is a lone pair and another lone pair, like you see here, two lone pairs. And so here, if you look at this structure here, I've drawn one oxygen up here and one off to the side and the lone pairs are on the wedge and the dash. So in this case, I want the lone pair on the wedge and the dash because it's easier to see what's going on with water in this case and we call that bent 109.5. So why is this bent 109.5 different than the bent 120 degrees? Well, the bent 120 degrees would be this guy here only we got to take this guy off and make it a lone pair. And uh, here's how I can make that a lone pair. Whoops. That can be my lone pair. So what makes them different bents? Well, let's take a look at them. Do you see how the angles are not exactly the same? Okay, so here, this bottom angle is a little wider than this one. This is the 109.5 and this is the 120. So we have a bent 109.5 and we have a bent 120. The bent 109.5 starts off with a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. And that's why you get the bent 109.5. And this is the best way to draw it. 
could you imagine drawing this where you put the the uh, electron pairs on the one going up and the one going to the side and you put the hydrogens on the wedge and the dash. So this is a correct drawing, but it's not very good because you've just drawn this this way. So can you see that this is gonna be a 109.5 very easily from the way you've drawn it? The answer is no, this is a poor form of communication. So you don't do it just like this one. Does this look like a three-legged stool? Not very easily. So these are better ways to draw them. So from the tetrahedral electron pair geometry with four pair, and here's the four pair on water, you're gonna get a tetrahedral electron pair geometry, which again, looks like this. And then when you fill in the blanks, you're gonna either get tetrahedral for all four pairs are bonded to an atom, trigonal, pyramidal, if one of the pairs is a lone pair and bent if two of the pairs are lone pairs. Okay, now what if you have the trigonal bipyramidal electron pair geometry? Now remember, this means that you have the axials and the equatorials. Now, I find a lot of people for the equatorials to say equatorial, and so they spell it E-Q-U-I, equatorial. You have to remember that this word is based on the equator, and the equator is E-Q-U-A. So these are not equatorial, they're equatorial, equatorial, so equator. Now, here are examples of the four different things you could have if your electron pair geometry is equatorial, or excuse me, is trigonal bipyramidal, and you have equatorial and axial. So here, all five, we have bonds to atoms, and so you get trigonal bipyramidal with 90 degrees and 120 degrees. Uh, I leave the 180 off for the axials, but you could put that in there if you wanted to. Now let's take a look at what happens when you have a lone pair like with sulfur tetrahydride. So where do you put the lone pair? Your choice is to put it axial or to put it equatorial. And the answer is you put it equatorial. The deal is, is that lone pair actually repels better than a bonding pair. So you wanna get it as far apart from things as is possible. So if you put it here at the equatorial, it's got two of these 90 degree angles and two 120 angles. If you put it on an axial, it'll have three 90 degree angles. And so really it's those 90 degree angles that are really bad. You wanna have as few 90 degree angles between your equatorial lone, or between your lone pair and everything else. By putting a lone pair equatorial, you only have two 90 degree angles. If you put it axial, you have three 90 degree angles, which is bad. See the face, it's bad. Two is better. So you're gonna put it in an equatorial position. So that's why the lone pair goes in the equatorial position is to reduce repulsion with these 90 degree angles. And that's gonna be the case for lone pairs afterwards. They will all go into the equatorial position. Because if you imagine, if you put another equatorial in here, lone pair, it'll be 120 between these. If you put the lone pair axial, you've got a 90 degree between two lone pairs, which is really just horrible. So they'll all go in equatorial positions. The lone pairs will go in equatorial positions. So this one right here, you have the lone pair in the equatorial position. And notice I picked this to draw it because they call this a seesaw. So I'm gonna flip this around a little bit so you can see why they call it a seesaw. Here, you've got the legs going up to the middle of the seesaw and there you go. Um, when I was a kid, we called these teeter-totters. And the idea was to uh, get the other person up in the air and when you're down here, you jump off and that way they would just land on their butt and it really hurt. But they didn't call this a teeter-totter, they called it a seesaw. Okay, so that's called a seesaw. And the angles are 90 plus 120. 
plus 180 degrees if you look at the two axials that are still there. Now in the third, we put the lone pairs, I'm gonna put them on the wedge and the dash. So here's the example, this chlorine trihydride. And here we call this T-shaped. And the reason we call this T-shaped is if I rotate this a bit, you can see that it's a T. And it's an uppercase T, not a lowercase T. So you wanna call it T-shaped with an uppercase T. And the angles are 90 degrees and 180 degrees. And notice, since we don't have any bonds that are 120 degrees apart, that disappears. And then finally, let's say that you have a molecule that has the trigonal bipyramidal electron pair geometry, but you have three lone pairs. They all go in the equatorial positions and you end up with two bonds that are in axial positions. So we call this linear 180 degrees. Okay, one more set of molecular shapes and that would be these. If you have an octahedral electron pair geometry, and remember for this one, you basically have this, the octahedral, and all angles are 90 degrees or 180 degrees. So here's an example where all four pairs are bonding pairs. So we have something that looks like this. We call it octahedral, then the angles are 90 degrees and 180 degrees. Now, since all these positions are equivalent, where are you gonna put a lone pair? You could put it anywhere. The best place to put them is either on the top or the bottom. In this case, I put them at the top because uh, I was running out of space up here and I had space at the bottom to draw this long bond in the hydrogen. However, if we flip this around, you can see how this looks like a square pyramid. So let me show you that square pyramid. Here it is. Here's the octahedral electron pair geometry. And if I put a lone pair on this guy, so we'll just pretend there's a lone pair there. Can you see how this is square? But when we look at it from the side, it's a pyramid. So square, pyram uh, how do you say this? Pyramidal. Or if you want to sound like you're from England, you say square pyramidal. I don't care. This is not going to be one of those uh, uh, tests where you, you give me the answers. Uh, what do they call those? A verbal test. You're not going to have one of those. So when you're writing this down and you're thinking about it as pyramidal, I won't know that you're thinking about it that way. Or if you're thinking pyramidal, I won't know either. And notice, again, this is pyramidal, like pyramid, so R-A, not pyramid. Okay, so this is called square pyramidal, and you've got these 180 degrees. So this wedge and this dash are 180 degrees apart. This wedge and this dash are 180 degrees apart. Then you have all these 90s. Now, what happens if you have two lone pairs. Well, remember lone pairs repel each other really well. So what's the best place to put two lone pairs on a molecule? And the answer is put them 180 degrees apart. So you end up with this. So if you take a look at this guy right here, it ends up being what's called square planar. So here is my octahedral electron pair geometry. If I make this a lone pair, which doesn't stick out into space, and this alone pair, which doesn't stick out into space, you end up with a flat square, square planar. Okay, so those are the molecular shapes for an octahedral electron pair geometry. So now we're gonna do a little bit more. We're actually gonna answer some questions now and apply what we've learned. So predicting the shapes of of these jump or these uh, molecules here. So remember what the steps are. So I'm going to move this over. Step number one is you need the formula. Step number two is you need the Lewis structure. So I want to remind you for this guy here, we've got six electrons for silicon, or excuse me, 
four for silicon because it's in 4A. You've got seven for each chlorine because it's in, uh, whoops, that should be four. You've got seven for each uh, chlorine because it's in group 7A. Four times seven is 28. 28 plus four is 32 electrons. Now, uh, oops, uh, we need to get the Lewis structure. We're gonna put silicon in the middle because it likes to make four bonds. And then we're gonna put lone pairs on each of the surrounding atoms until they get an octet. And then we'll put the rest of them on the central atom. But how many have we used? Well, I've used eight here, eight here, that's 16, eight here, that's 24, and eight here, that's 32. So I've used up all 32 electrons and this is what I have. So this is the Lewis structure. And then we're gonna get the uh, electron pair geometry. So the electron pair geometry, oh, actually we wanna identify how many pairs we have. We have four pairs and I can do that right here. One, two, three, four. So now we can get the electron pair geometry, which looks like this, one, two, three, four. So here's my four pairs. Notice that this balloon isn't drawn in full because it's behind that balloon. And you can't see that balloon because it's, it's hidden by the one behind it. If, if I were to draw it this way, see how this balloon is hidden behind this one. So that's the way I've kind of drawn it. All right, and then five would be, okay, let's place in those atoms. Ah, look at that, I only have four lines, not seven. I'm gonna add one more because I think it'll look better. Oh, and I'm gonna put one more there. Okay, so I'm gonna put in the lone pairs around each of these chlorines. And what do we call this uh, molecular geometry? We call it tetrahedral. And what are the angles? 109.5 degrees. It's like a radio station, 109.5, coming to you and playing smooth tetrahedral. Okay. So that's my dream one day is to own a radio station 109.5 and call it tetrahedral, K-tet. What do you think? Yeah, kind of a stupid idea. All right, so that's the uh, shape of silicon tetrachloride. We're gonna do a few more examples here. So predicting the shapes and molecules of polyatomic ions. So we're gonna be looking here at uh, the hydronium ion and whatever this ion is called. So here's the hydronium ion, H3O plus. That's the formula. The Lewis structure, well, I know this has uh, three times one for the hydrogen plus six for the oxygen. And then, oh, for the charge, we have to take away one. So we have eight electrons. We're gonna put oxygen in the middle because it makes more bonds than hydrogen. And we're gonna put the lone pair here. And then we're gonna put the charge on the outside of brackets. So this is the Lewis structure. And then how many pairs do we have? One, two, three, four. Four pair, which means we wanna take our oxygen and draw it this way. So let's see now, where do we wanna put the lone pair? We want this to make the most sense. So I'm gonna put the lone pair right here at the top and the three hydrogens as the legs to my three-legged stool. And then I'm gonna put a plus here. Now let's do a little quick review on formal charge here. Why does this have a plus one charge? Well, what is the formal charge on this hydrogen, this one right here? Well, if we deconstruct this for this bond, one electron goes to the hydrogen, 
one goes to the oxygen. For this bond, one electron goes to the oxygen, one goes to the hydrogen. Here, these two electrons are on the oxygen, so they stay there. And then for this bond, one electron goes to the hydrogen, one to the oxygen. Now, if we have one electron on the hydrogen, that is a neutral hydrogen atom. If we have six electrons on an oxygen, that's a neutral oxygen atom. So take a look here. This has a formal charge of zero. This has a formal charge of zero because it's just like a hydrogen atom with one electron. And this has a formal charge of zero. What about this oxygen? Well, if it had six electrons, it had no charge. What if it only had five valence electrons? Well, if you lose an electron, you become positive. So this has a positive charge. So did you hear the joke about the atom or the ion that walked into a bar? I said, bartender, I've had a bad day. Pour me a triple. The bartender says, okay, here you go. Bad day, what's wrong? And the, the ion says, the cat ion says to the bartender, well, I've lost an electron. So here, six and then five, I've lost an electron. And the bartender says, are you sure? And the, the, the cat ion says, yeah, I'm positive, but I'm, I'm Okay, feel free to not repeat that joke to anybody. All right, so what do we call this molecular geometry where it's a three-legged stool? Trigonal, pyramidal. And what are the approximate angles? 109.5, because when you have a tetrahedral, it's 109.5. Okay, let's take a look at this one now the ClF2, and let's figure out what's going on with that. So I'm gonna do this one a little faster, ClF2 plus, we have seven for the chlorine, seven for each fluorine, and minus one electron for the positive charge. This is where a lot of people get tripped up. When you have a plus charge, you have to take away an electron, boom. So, you have 20 electrons. What are we gonna put in the center? Fluorine likes to make one bond, chlorine one, three, or five. So we're gonna put chlorine in the middle and the fluorine's on the outside. And then we're gonna put octets on each fluorine. And so far we've used how many electrons? 16, four left over. You put the rest on the central atom and there you go. And then we put a plus on it so that people understand that this is a cation. So how many pairs on this guy? One, two, three, four. So I'm gonna draw my chlorine here with four pair. And now we're gonna fill it in. So where do we wanna put the lone pairs? We wanna put the lone pairs here on the wedge and the dash and the fluorines here like this. And then we're gonna put brackets around it and a plus charge on it. And what do we call this shape where it's not a straight arm, but it's one that's bent. It's called bent. And what are the angles? 109.5 degrees. So there you go. All right, let's put that to the side and we'll do one more here. What is the shape of this polyatomic ion, ICL4 minus? So I'm gonna go through the steps fairly quickly. ICL4 negative, seven for iodine, seven for each chlorine. And because it's a negative charge, we have to add an electron. And so we get 36 electrons. And then we take a look at the Lewis structure. Which do we put in the middle? We're gonna put iodine because it can make one, uh, three, five or seven bonds. And we're gonna put the chlorines around it. So there's your four chlorines. Lone pairs on each chlorine, one at a time. And then 
we find out we've used 32 electrons. So where do we put the other four? On iodine. So here we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six pair. So we're gonna have something that looks like this. There's the six. Where do we wanna put the lone pairs? Top and the bottom. And we're gonna put one chlorine here, one chlorine here. One here and one here. So what do we call this shape where it looks kind of flat, but it's square, square. Well, we can't call it a pyramid because pyramids stick up. Square, planar. And what are the angles between all of these? 90 degrees and 180 degrees. And we have one more thing to finish this up. Here, we should have done a negative. And here, we draw a negative. And that's how you get the molecular shape of a polyatomic ion or a molecule. Uh, for your homework, you're gonna be doing some of this and for your lab, you're gonna be doing some of this. All right, thank you for listening.